Yeah. Talk about your thing. Our, about the thing there. So now I'm going to jump into um, sort of these two planters that I made. Um, what was your thinking behind the planters? Where, yeah. What were you trying to accomplish? My next thing was wanting to go further into this wet molding and exploring things. And so it was one, I went ahead and bought a hide of veggie tan um, holster leather. So I was like, I'm going to do this right. I'm going to start figuring this out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I started looking around my house of what would be a cool thing to press into leather. Mm -hmm. And we love plants. Uh, that's one thing that we give ourselves permission to shop for. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so um, it was like, well, we always need new things to have decorative pots for our plants. And so I started then looking at all of our current um, pots, and they have a ton of really fun textures. And so this one was sort of a southwesty um, piece. And so I, again, was just trying to do the saran wrap. It didn't fit well into my vacuum bag. Mm -hmm. And I quickly learned that on both of these pieces, that was not enough pressure, <laughs> which is an okay thing to learn. Like, yeah. um, I still went through the whole concept of like, but what does it mean to sew this? And also setting myself up so that um, when I was sewing, how do I eventually do this long-term um, like, how can I do something? I, I watch a TV show with my wife every evening, and so what can I be doing with my hand right. while sitting there? So learning how to do a bunch of the prep work, so that I'm literally just sitting there with a pair of pliers and my two needles and the leather in my lap, and uh, just having this peaceful, wonderful moment. And so that was like one of the parts of this project of like, how do I keep my hands busy but also enjoy doing this thing with my wife? You know? Sure, sure. Um, and so I quickly learned well. If I'm going to make these big, if I want to continue making these types of shapes, mm -hmm. I need to figure out how to press this into something flat. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I reached out to one of my friends who just is a hobbyist woodworker who has a tiny little CNC sure. router table. And I was like, hey, you're always up for doing fun, creative things um, with his router table. So and, just to clarify, yeah. CNC is computer numerical control, meaning that a little robot gives a tool path to a routing machine, which is a spinning cutter, and that will cut a pattern or texture into a hard, flat surface of wood, plastic, whatever you've got. Yeah. And so you're using the CNC router to make a pattern or texture that you're going to press into the vegetable. Yeah, okay. exactly. So I asked him, I just gave him a few parameters of my my vacuum press bag can hold something that's 24 inches long. So. Okay. Let's go do that. You know, it's a little bit oversized, but knowing that I was going to put some thickness. No bigger than your bag. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> that was my limitation. Um, and that this one was eight inches, and that seemed like a reasonable size height. And that I didn't want the pattern to go all the way up into the edge because I wanted a nice border around to um, okay. just make the... You spend all this time stitching, and you might as well show that off. Uh, right. So how does that math work? When you're you're doing a circle, right? So we've got pi involved, right? Two pi r mm -hmm. to get the perimeter length. And you said your vacuum bag is 24 inches, right? Yeah. So we're going to call pi exactly three for those of you who don't like math. Yeah. Which means that you get an eight inch diameter pot, right, from a 24 inch length mm -hmm. of leather. Mm -hmm. And so you wanted your, your pattern inset to be slightly shorter than that so that the two edges didn't mate? Um, yeah, so that this, pa this I, so I didn't have to worry about this pattern having like how we do shirts and things like that where you have the pattern run right or over across the seam. Yeah. I didn't want to worry about any of that and so I wanted You didn't a want flat your alignment border. to go from like this to something like yeah. that and look wonky. Got it. Yeah. So I just asked him to make sure that the pattern had a border on all four sides and so I can get close to the camera yeah show, and them, show them what you've got let's see here so we'll keep getting closer the pink is the camera. pink thanks so you can kind of see that that's a repeating geometric shape there and then we also have fun and I you're gonna see two patterns here the first time he ran the geometric shape you ran it too fast and it kept breaking parts so you have to learn all about feeds and speeds is a word that oh, yeah. people on CNC's use but the upper one sort of looks like wood bark a little bit mm -hmm. um, and so that is 
that that was kind of an I want to explore that one. Um, and I go and I pick these ones up for my buddy tomorrow, so I haven't gotten a chance to try them out. But the geometric one has potential to fail because if it for some reason isn't as consistent, your eye is going to be really drawn towards that. Um, the repeat pattern, your eye will just pick it out more, which is okay because it, it, leather's a natural product and that's going to be okay and I don't need it to be super precise, but the kind of one that looks like wood bark has a little bit more forgiveness built into it because right. your eye's not expecting something to come and be repeated over and over again. So one thing I found whenever I'm trying to do like a cloned pattern texture, what mm -hmm. I'll do is I'll cheat. I'll, I'll 3D print whatever pattern I want to do my emboss with and then um, I'll make sure that the profiles are very dramatic and sharp, kind of like a cookie cutter. Okay. I'll get the weather, the leather super wet, like really wet, and then I'll just park some serious dead weight on it. And I'll leave it there for um, two or three days. Oh, nice. And it'll start to dry. And the trick is in Seattle, if you, <laughs> if you leave it too long, it can mildew and you don't want that to happen. Um, but you can always skive the mildew off and then oil it, and that's not a problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that'll be a good way to get pressure. So I made a comment in one of the videos. I was like, I don't know if people still have textbooks, but I do. And so I just park, I just take, you know, half the sh books off my library shelf and just park them on top with, you know, something between the wet yeah. leather and the book. Yeah. <laughs> just, you know, a little piece of plastic. That's fine. And then just stack it with, you know, 60 pounds. Mm -hmm. and just leave it out there and it usually takes the impression pretty well yeah yeah nice so that's that's something you can throw into your i like that yeah and and as a woodworker i have lots of clamps and plywood as a backer so that's always an option that would be better right <laughs> if you could clamp it down to a surface yeah. i know my teens probably don't have a slew of clamps that's yeah. you know we all wish we had that yeah. many clamps <laughs> but for those of you who don't dead weight works so yeah. when when you're going to do this plan, um, are you planning on doing a clamp up? And if so, how are you going to make sure that the center is receiving the same amount of pressure as the perimeter of your pattern? Yeah. Um, so I am planning on using the vacuum bag for this first round, but let's say I didn't have that. The way I would do it is, is that I would probably get like three quarter inch thick plywood that's slightly oversized of the, um, the piece, the and template. So, yeah, the template, and I'd have two of those. So, I would actually, I guess it wouldn't be super important for it to be underneath, but I would actually intentionally put one underneath. So when you have a clamp, this is more of your geometry. Is is that where the points of the clamp are? Yeah. It's basically like 45 degrees out from that is where the pressure is getting applied to. So by you making more distance away from where that clamping pressure is, that means that the triangle essentially gets broader. Right, know? right. Um, and so uh, by basically you're creating platens or culls that you're going to put it in between. So it's going to be stuck between two really flat pieces of something. So, you know, you would have to, because it's eight inches thick, you know, I would be at least trying to get a clamp that might have a four inch deep throat and I would just kind of do like a V pattern of alternating like I'd probably do two on the end and then I would just sort of alternate because if I, they were both at four inches right here they would just be butting up against each other right and so I would just kind of do a kind of zipper pattern and just really try to distribute the weight but chances are higher that the weight still won't be as even as a, a set of textbooks so right. um, more ideal maybe instead of clamps would be to go outside and find those leftover cinder blocks that have been sitting around i've actually done a lot of veneer presses in my wood shop that way of, i just have a bunch of leftover landscaping cinder blocks oh yeah well and when you talk to a blacksmith they're like do you have anything heavy and i'm like yeah i've got this 200 pound block of metal they're like yeah. do you have anything lighter <laughs> yeah we do yeah cool so yeah so we'll probably do a follow-up on another video where you tell us exactly how that layup went, right? Because you're going to... That gonna, sounds fun, yeah. Yeah, we'll do a follow-up and say, yeah. uh, so Kim's idea was this video, and we'll do the follow-up interview yeah. saying this is uh, how it worked, and yeah. you'll tell us what you liked and what you didn't? Yeah, I can definitely do that. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks for hanging out. It was fun to share all my little projects. <laughs>